Good morning. morning. Welcome to everyone as we gather for worship, whether you're here inside our building or worshiping with us online. It is a great and wonderful thing that we can worship our good and gracious God together. And today, as we worship, we're thinking about what it means that Jesus came to us as the Messiah sent by God to save his people. So as we begin our time of worship together, let's turn our attention toward the one true God whom we worship and in whose name we gather. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious and loving Lord, we thank you for gathering us into your church by your Spirit and making us brothers and sisters in Christ, part of your family, your beloved forgiven children. We pray, Lord, that as we gather together at your feet, that you would open us up to receive whatever it is you have for us in worship today, that you would once again fill us with your love and with yourself, And then help us to respond to you and your great love for us with wholehearted praise and adoration. And we ask these things in the holy and precious name of Jesus, your Son, our Savior. And everyone said, Amen. In 1 John 1, 8-9, we read, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to God and receive the free and full forgiveness he gives us through his Son, Jesus Christ. Most holy and most loving God, we admit to you and to each other that we are creatures who either through foolishness or willfulness often choose darkness instead of light. Here and now, we surrender to you our fears and proud opinions, our short-sighted folly and our pompous wisdom, our deep-seated sins and our apathy towards change and renewal. Please forgive the darkness and pain we have inflicted on others and restore the light-starved hopes and ideals within our own souls. Trusting your grace, we earnestly pray Create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. Through Christ Jesus, our Savior. Amen. My friends, Epiphany, the season we are now in, is good news. The light comes not to sear and blind us, but to save us. Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners, and in his name I declare to you, your sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Take up your forgiveness with thanksgiving and live without shame or anxiety. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ has been given to you. Amen. Let's stand and sing our first song. Amen. 
above all names Blessed Redeemer Emmanuel Verses 12 to 31. Just as a body, the one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now, you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Now, eagerly desire the greater gifts. Here ends the reading. The second reading for this Sunday is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 16 to 30. Jesus went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, 
The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened upon him and he began saying to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they said? Jesus said to them, surely you will quote this proverb to me, physician heal yourself, and you will tell me, do here in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. Truly, I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time, when the sky was shut for three and a half years, and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet, Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Sarifath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elijah the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up and drove him out of the town and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Here ends the second reading. I haven't talked about my dog Coda in a very long time. Coda just had a birthday. She turned two and we bought her some dog treats. So Coda is what they call a rescue dog. Where she would have been born would have been in a very cold area. She would have had to live on the streets and who knows what her life would have been like. It wouldn't have been very easy. Now she celebrates her birthday. She lives with us. We adopted her. We buy her presents. We love her, we feed her, we take care of her and get her to the vet. She has a really good life. Most importantly, she's really loved and cared for. Why am I talking about my dog Coda today? Well, it really makes me think of who we are as children of God. We've left behind a life that would have been really bad, not good, hard for us, but now we live as wonderful, loved, cared for children because we are God's special children. And you know what? She lives a very happy life. And I think we have to remember that too, because sometimes we forget all that stuff that we can leave behind and just remember how much God loves us so very much. Let's pray about that. Dear God, we are your special children. You love us so much and you have rescued us. You've adopted us and made us one of your own. And we thank you for that. In Jesus name, amen. All right, do you want another treat? Do you want a treat? Uh, Carolyn and I didn't talk, but her children's lesson actually ties together with a sermon, as you'll see. If you notice what brand of treat she had for her dog. Uh, for the month of February, we're going to be planning a mission series, and we're going to have four guest speakers that month, each sharing about a different area of missions, and the uh, series will be called Jesus Heart for the World, and so watch for more details on that. And the title of today's message is The Anointed One. Let's pray. Gracious and loving Lord, wonderful, what a wonderful thing it is that you uh, not only love us and have saved us, but you uh, speak to us through your word. And so, in the quietness of these moments that we have together, we pray, dear Lord, that you would uh, do that once again, that you would help us to hear uh, by your Spirit what it is that you're saying to us, and that you would plant your words deep in our hearts and help us to live by them, because you, indeed, have the words of eternal life. In the precious and holy and matchless name of Jesus, we ask this, and everyone said, Oh, man. 
So we're going to begin uh, today's message with a bit of a quiz. Uh, there's an image on your screen, and I'm wondering if anybody can tell me what these are. I can't hear you. I hear a few murmurings. This should be easy. What are these things? They're sausages. Okay, for bonus points, can you tell me what kind of sausages they are and who makes them? Anybody? Take a wild guess. What's that? Yeah, well, thank you. Um, but you have the cheat notes back there, don't you? Yes. These are currywurst sausages, and they are made by Volkswagen at their car factory in Wolfsburg, Germany. And they've been making them since 1973. They are very famous. They actually have their own Volkswagen part number. It's part number 199-398-500A. And it is Volkswagen's most produced part. They make more of these than anything else. And I did not know this until very, very recently. And as I thought about that, I realized I had misjudged Volkswagen. And I had put them in a box. I thought that they were just a company that made cars. And as a result, I've been living my entire life not knowing what could have been. And because of my lack of faith, shall we say, I have never experienced a Volkswagen sausage. And the window, the window for me to do that is closing because last year Volkswagen announced that they are going to stop making meat-based sandwich, or sausages in 2025 to reduce carbon emissions. Apparently cows produce greenhouse gases. Maybe some of you knew that already. Uh, but what they're going to do is they're going to keep making food, but all of it after that year will be plant-based only. So we can, uh, you know, kid around about this and say, well, sausages, Volkswagen, what's the big deal? But let's think about this. What about when we put God in a box? And we tend to do that. I know there was one time when I was at a conference and I was uh, serving as an usher, <coughs> And I was standing on a balcony uh, overlooking the crowd of people while this uh, concert was going on. And uh, I had this tangible sense that the Holy Spirit was moving back and forth uh, above and throughout the crowd. And I thought to myself, how can this be? Like there's, like there's Catholics and Anglicans and all kinds of evangelicals and the odd Lutheran. Like how can the Holy Spirit be doing that? And then in that moment, I realized I had put God in a box. And I hadn't even realized I had done that until he showed me that he was outside of the box that I had put him in. Now, for us, to put God in a box is a very natural thing to do because what we're trying to do is we're trying to understand God using the categories we have. We're trying to not only understand who he is, but we're trying to understand what he does. But here's the thing. God will never fit into the boxes that we try to create for him. With our finite human minds, we will never fully comprehend an infinite divine being who transcends space and time and created all things simply by speaking them into existence. Much of who God is and what he does will always, always, always be a mystery to us. And yet, this mysterious, infinite God has chosen to love us broken human beings and interact with us in this world in order to bring us into a rich, full, abundant life with Him. So the question I'm asking you to think about today is, what are some ways that perhaps you have put God in a box? And as you think about that question... Uh, we're going to uh, reflect on that as we continue our series called Jesus Revealed, in which we're looking at passages in the Bible where Jesus is revealed to us as God. 
And so a couple of Sundays ago, we uh, considered how Jesus is the God who took our place in sinfulness to give us his place in righteousness. And then last Sunday, we looked at how Jesus is the God who has taken all of our shame away from us. And then uh, today, we're going to be looking at uh, Luke chapter 4, verses 16 to 30. So if you have a Bible or a Bible app, I invite you to turn there now. And uh, what we find as we dig into this passage is that Jesus has uh, begun his ministry. Uh, the events described for us here happened sometime after his baptism, sometime after he was tempted by the devil in the wilderness. And uh, he may have even uh, been doing some ministry for a while, uh, based on what we read later on in the passage. And he was uh, serving people around uh, the Sea of Galilee and doing so in the power of the Holy Spirit. And he was teaching in the local synagogues with wisdom and great authority. And though Luke doesn't mention any healing so far, uh, Jesus may have been doing that as well because that was a significant part of his ministry. And he was well regarded, he was becoming well regarded and well known in that region. And so one Sabbath, he goes home, one day of worship, a Saturday, and he attends worship in the synagogue in his hometown of Nazareth. And he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened it up to the point that we know as chapter 61, and he read these words. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, it was the tradition back then, and still is uh, today in uh, synagogues, that the rabbi or teacher would stand up to read God's Word and then sit down to teach or explain the passage through a sermon. So Jesus did that. He sat down and he began by saying these words, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now I imagine that most of the people in the synagogue that day were shocked by what Jesus said. Because Jesus was claiming that he was God's anointed one, the Messiah, sent by God to save his people. And Jesus was also, by reading this passage from Isaiah and applying it to himself, he was also telling the people there that day what his life's mission was. To preach good news to the poor. To set the captives free and to proclaim that the time of the Lord's favor had begun through him. Now, as the people responded, they started off by saying, well, he's certainly well-spoken. But then they asked that question, but isn't this Joseph's son? In other words, they were thinking that Jesus could not possibly be the Messiah. He was just an ordinary guy from their hometown. And they would have known him ever since his mother was changing his dirty swaddling cloths. But by thinking of Jesus in that way, what they were doing is they were putting God in a box and saying it was not possible for God to have Jesus as his Messiah. Now, to be fair to the people of Nazareth that were in that synagogue that day, they didn't know Jesus like we know him today. We know Jesus as the glorified one, the one who has resurrected from the dead. But they did not. They knew Jesus in his pre-glorified state as a very ordinary looking human being and as Isaiah puts it, Whoops, I missed the passage. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. 
But still, they were putting God in a box by saying he could not possibly work through this ordinary human being and choose him as his Messiah. Now here's the thing that happens. When we put God in a box, at the very same time, we are putting ourselves on a pedestal. And we're putting ourselves on a pedestal because we are saying we know what God can do better than he does. We are, in essence, placing ourselves above God and judging him. And by doing so, we cut ourselves off from all of the good things that God wants to do in our lives. And we end up working against God. And there's no possible scenario where that turns out well. Now, Jesus, knowing what was going on in the people's hearts that day, confronts them. He knows that they want him to prove that he really is the Messiah by healing people like he has done elsewhere. So he warns them that their rejection of the salvation that he is offering to them would result in it being shared with the Gentiles or non-Jewish people, just as God had done in the past through Elijah and Elisha. And a warning, even if it's true and given in love, will result either in repentance or rejection. And it all depends on what is ruling in the listener's heart. Is it humility or is it pride? You see, humility says, I could be wrong. And a humble heart examines its own motivations and actions in light of the warning that's been given. But, a, but pride says, there's no way I could be wrong. And a pride-filled heart rejects the warning and feels threatened by it, so it seeks to destroy the source of that warning in order to eliminate the warning. Blinded by their own pride, the people of Nazareth could not see the love behind Jesus' warning, nor could they see the box that they had put God in or the pedestal that they had put themselves on. They were not open to learning and growing with God. Instead, they sought to get rid of Jesus by carrying out the sentence due to someone who is guilty of blasphemy being thrown off a cliff to their death. But Jesus was not harmed that day. Somehow he walked right through that angry mob and continued onward in the direction that his heavenly Father was leading him. The people of Nazareth both misjudged Jesus and themselves that day. They grossly underestimated Jesus and they vastly overestimated themselves. And this instance of misjudgment foreshadows the cross when the holiest, most innocent human being who ever lived would be declared guilty of all human sin throughout all time. You see, God always, always, always judges correctly. And he knows the things that we do, the bad things that we do, and the corruption in our soul, he knows that it's far worse than we could ever imagine. And yet God, even though he knows how bad things really are inside of us, still chooses to love us infinitely and unconditionally with self-giving love. And God the Father correctly estimated that it would take a perfect sacrifice of infinite worth to pay for the forgiveness of all the world's sin. And God the Son correctly understood that he should be the one who came into this world and wrapped himself in human flesh to take our place and face judgment for all of our sins so we could be set free. And God the Holy Spirit correctly sought out and softened human, softened human hearts so that they could repent and believe this good news and receive the forgiveness of sins and salvation that Jesus is offering to everyone through faith in him. 
So what does this mean for all of us here and now, today? No one can go unchanged after an encounter with Jesus. The direction the change will take pivots around this question, who is going to be judging whom? And it's only in the light of the misjudgment that Jesus willingly experienced that we flawed, broken human beings can see that it is safe for us. Better than that, it is the best possible thing for us to do, to come into the light of Jesus' love and be judged by him. For though Jesus will easily see that we miserably fall short in every measure that matters, Jesus more than covers the gap of our sin with the gift of his infinite grace. And when God the Father puts the shortfall of our sin side by side with the infinite surplus of Messiah Jesus' sacrifice, the only just course of action for the Father to take is to set us free from all of our guilt and shame and welcome us into his family as his beloved, forgiven children. Messiah Jesus has come to preach good news to us poor sinners, to set us captives free, and to declare his unconditional love and favor for us forever. You see, when Jesus judges us, he doesn't condemn us. He judges us with gracious justice, justice that makes us whole and right like God originally intended for us to be. Jesus is the God who experienced our misjudgment so that we could be made right by his gracious judgment. During World War II, Corrie Ten Boom and her family were sent to a Nazi concentration camp for sheltering Jews in their home during the time that Holland was occupied by the Nazis. And several of Corey's family members died in those camps. But Corey survived, and then after the war, she traveled around the world speaking about the importance of forgiving others. One evening after she spoke, and people came up to talk to her afterwards, as they often did, she noticed a man walking towards her, and she recognized him as one of the guards at one of the concentration camps that she had been in. And though Corey had often spoken the need to forgive others, she could not forgive this man in her own strength. She had to ask God to help her to forgive him in his strength. And she wrote, when he, that is God, tells us to love our enemies, he gives along with the command the love itself. And so, dear friends, the action step that I'm leaving with you today comes right out of the pages of the Bible. It's from Philippians chapter 2. So I'm asking you to consider all that Jesus has done for you and is doing for you and will do for you. And then consider these words. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do, not, uh, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, 
God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you for coming into this world to be the anointed one, our Messiah, who has come to make us and all things right. And though we can never really judge or even understand things as they really are, we pray that you would help us to grow in receiving your love and your grace and your justice that completes us and makes us whole in you. Help us to better reflect your love into the world around us so that more and more people may know you as their Messiah. In your holy and precious and matchless name we ask this. And everyone said, Amen. Here at Walnut Grove Lutheran Church, our vision is to be a church that helps people of all generations to be passionate about, equipped for, and effective at transforming lives for the kingdom of God. And if you would like to partner with us financially to help make that happen, there's a few ways uh, you can do that. Uh, one is uh, you can give online at wglc.org slash donate. Or if you'd like to set up an ongoing giving relationship with us, you can do that at admin at wglc.org, and we'll make arrangements with you for that to happen. Or if you brought your offering with you today, there's a basket on the table, and you could drop it in there uh, as you exit uh, this uh, worship area. Let's uh, sing our next song, 10,000 Reasons.
invite you to stand if you're able for prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we lift up to you our broken and hurting world and we pray for peace wherever there is war or violence. We pray for restoration for all who have been driven from their homes because of violence or natural disaster or persecution. We especially pray for the Tariq family, Tariq, Shazia, Irene, Sarah, Simon, and Solomon. We pray, Lord, that you would watch over them and keep them safe and healthy as they continue to wait in Thailand for the day when they can come to Canada and we can help them to begin a new life here. And we pray that you would, in a way that only you can, hasten that day. Help them to come soon, we pray. Lord, we pray for our uh, world who's been impacted in many ways by the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, there's just so many new things that happen. The various variants and how they spread differently and act differently and impact people differently. And uh, now we're in a season where uh, there seems to be a very contagious variants going around. We're thankful, Lord, that uh, in many cases people are perhaps not as ill as they would have otherwise been with earlier forms of the disease. But yet there's still people who are very sick and still people who are dying. And so we pray for your comfort for all those who are grieving we pray for your healing for all those who have COVID. We pray for all of the medical people who are uh, caring for those who are ill. We pray that you would bless them and grant to them your strength and your encouragement and keep them healthy and protect them and their families, we pray. And most of all, Lord, we pray that you would help us to keep our eyes on you. Because this is not too big of a problem for you to handle. And so help us, Lord, to be people of faith, hope, and love who continue to reflect your light into the darkness of the world around us. Help us to be people of peace, people of encouragement, Give us eyes to see and wisdom to act in those opportunities that you give us to help and encourage others. And Lord, we pray that when we come through this on the other side, that you would help us to remember the lessons that you have taught us through this difficult time that you are a God who continues to hold the world in your loving hands. We pray, Lord, for all those who are sharing the good news of Jesus Christ throughout the world. Today, we pray for Deaconess Va Savet, who serves the Lutheran Church in Kampot, Cambodia. We pray that you would bless Deaconess Savet and that you would watch over her and keep her safe, that you would provide what she needs for the work you are calling her to do, and that you would work in and through her in a powerful way to draw the hearts of more and more people closer and closer to you. We pray for all those who are grieving this day. We pray for Lynn T., who is grieving the death of her sister, Iep. We pray for Ryan V. and his family as they grieve the death of Ryan's father, Theo. And for all others who are grieving, we now name them before you in the silence of our hearts. Dear Jesus, we thank you for dying for us on the cross and rising again to give us the sure and certain promise of resurrection life. We pray that you would wrap your arms of love around all who are grieving and comfort them with your presence and your promise of life eternal with you. 
We pray all, for all who are going through a difficult time and need a special measure of your rest, comfort, encouragement, and strength. We lift up to you Earl and Marion and their family and Otto and Shauna. We pray for those who are in need of your healing touch, for Tamara who needs healing from a concussion, for Maddie who has a long road of radiation, physio, and recovery ahead, for Corey P who has serious health challenges from those who are recovering from surgery, included Mike M, Jordan R, Diane R, and Susan G. And for others who need your healing touch, included including Bryant G's dad, Lori, Clarissa's dad, Bob J, Jody C, Glenn P, Marlene B, Elizabeth P, Donna L, Julianne L, Pastor Carl, Lynn, and Ruth H. And for all others who need your healing, we now name them before you in our heart. Dear Lord, you are the great physician and the source of all healing whenever it happens. And so we pray that you would strengthen our loved ones both in body and in spirit and help them to know that you are always with them, that you always love them, and that they are forever safe with you. Lord, we pray all of our spoken and silent prayers in Jesus' name, and we pray as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As our time of worshiping God together comes to an end, and you go out into the world to share God's love with a broken and hurting world, Go with this blessing from God. May God the Father who led the wise men by the shining of a star to find the Christ, the light from light, lead you also in your pilgrimage to find the Lord. May God the Son who turned water into wine at the wedding feast at Cana, wedding feast at Cana, transform your lives and make glad your hearts. May God the Holy Spirit who came upon the beloved Son at his baptism in the river Jordan, pour out his gifts on you who have come to the waters of new birth. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you both now and forever. Amen. We sing our closing song. Come set your own.